Hey everybody, welcome or welcome back to Pets 101. I'm your host Nick. As always, disclaimers, I'm not an expert, I'm not a vet, I'm just somebody that worked at a pet store for 10 years and I now know that there's a lot of things that you probably don't know going into buying what we're going to talk about today, which is chameleons. Cool lizard, right? At the eyes, going in all different directions, right? Supposedly they change color based on their environment. Um, well, already right off, you're mistaken. They don't change color based on their environment. They actually change color based on their mood. So normally what you're going to get with a chameleon, the most typical one being the, um, not the panther, not the jackson, the veiled chameleon. And uh, actually those all three are pretty the most basic ones, but um, veiled chameleon seems to be the most commonly one sold at a pet store. And so um, their typical color is going to be a nice little light green. And then if they get stressed out, then they turn this really crazy weird green stripey color. Um, almost think of like a, uh, a tiger's stripes. And it's interesting if you know anything about camouflage, but that actually is really good camouflage to have crazy different colors, um, but all, you know, relatively close to what you would encounter in the environment that they are in. So if you look at a tiger, you think, no way is that camouflage. It looks like these crazy stripes. It, it, it leaps out at you if you're looking at it in, say, a compound or, you know, um, but if it is in, you know, where it usually likes to hunt, you know, like in tall, like, you know, uh, grass and stuff, I'm talking out of my butt here. I, I don't honestly know that much about tigers. I just know that, um, that the stripes actually break up you know, the, the eyes so that you don't just see one big uniform um, cat shape as if it were, you know, all black, say, like, you know, um, you know, like a panther or something. So, um, you know, the chameleon, uh, ideally, if you do end up getting one, should never actually be that, that stripy color because that means that they're stressed. They should always just be that nice uniform green color. And oftentimes they're hanging out on a, um, we'll get into the uh, equipment part of the video in a minute, but uh, normally they're hanging out on the brown vines that you hang up on the habitat. They like to be up high, so, you know, they don't really look like the vine. They don't change brown just because they're hanging out on the vines, so um, that's a common, you know, misconception about uh, chameleons. But, um, yeah, they are, uh, you know, really cool lizard, but they're probably going to be more of a pain to own than you initially realize. So, for instance, one one big missed opportunity that I've found is just the habitat in general. So, as always, uh, if you've been listening to my videos, you're probably sick of hearing the broken record, but you always need to set up your habitat before you get the animal. You don't get them at the same time. Um, this is especially true of a chameleon. You need to get that up to a certain temperature, up to a certain humidity, and you don't want to have all that going on while they're sitting there in the cardboard box that you typically get from a pet store. Most oftentimes, a pet, in a pet store, they just come in a little cardboard carrying case, and uh, the amount of time that it would take to set up the habitat, get it up to temperature, and all that stuff, that's hours that this poor thing is now sitting in a dark box without the right temperature, without the right humidity, and stressing itself out. And that's just not a great way to start uh, your relationship with your, um, you know, with your pet buddy. So, um, the problem with habitats that I've found is that the ones that you can find in any store, and even mostly online, are going to be okay for them when they're young. And then after that, once they get to be full adult size, there's really nothing out there. Like, besides having somebody uh, hand make one, so if you're a little MacGyver, then, you know, maybe you can, but uh, on, honestly, you know, unless you want it custom built, and that's probably going to be a pretty penny, an arm and a leg to pay for, then, you know, you really don't have the adequate... Uh, you know, environment for them. They need a very specific environment. And, you know, if you want to try and simulate where they would naturally be growing up, I mean, they need to have uh, something that has a whole lot of humidity, but also a whole lot of airflow. Now, already, anybody that's tried to keep a uh, habitat with both knows that that's a pretty difficult task to manage. If there's plenty of airflow, then that means that the humidity is going to dry up. If there's plenty of humidity, then that means that you can't really have much airflow. And if you don't have much airflow, but a lot of humidity, then there's going to be potential for mold and, um, you know, other, other issues. So, you know, um, getting their habitat set up is probably going to be one of the hardest things um, for them. So, again, I, I try to tell everybody in every episode that this is not going to be the end-all be-all for um, your research into getting one. I'm glad that you clicked on this video, and I hope that you continue your research because there's going to be a lot to look into before you fully consider getting one. It might be a little bit, you might be biting off a little bit more than you uh, can chew uh, once you 
look it up. But you know, long story short, you know, you're going to want to have uh, you know plenty of that's you know screen, you know sides. Uh, you want to have uh, plenty of height, you know, to the habitat. They like I said earlier, they do love to you know be up high. Um, they typically don't like to hunt, even though their their prey is typically going to be on the ground. And even that we'll get into in a bit. But, you know, for, for the, cr the cricket side, at least, the crickets are mostly going to be on the ground. They don't want to be on the ground with the crickets hunting. Um, if you've watched any of the other lizard videos before, much like many other lizards, once a chameleon has eaten its fill of, uh, let's say, the crickets, then they're not going to continue to eat the crickets once they are done eating. So, basically, they're going to let crickets crawl on them, bite them, you know, stress them out. Uh, until they're ready to eat again, so they like to be away from said crickets. Now, with mealworm dishes, because those are the two things that the chameleons will eat, is crickets and mealworms, so for the mealworms, which need to be in a dish so that they don't just go into the soil and then you never see them again, and then you just wasted money, um, typically I was used to, in the early years of uh, being in a pet store, just having the mealworm dish on the ground. And that's now something that they changed just before I left, where they would rather have the mealworms up in the vines with the chameleon, um, it seems to work out a little bit better that they, you know, often will find grub not just, you know, on the ground of the forest floor, but also in the tree with them. So it makes sense that you have crickets on the ground, you know, mealworms in the branches. They have two places to look where they were going to look anyway. So it makes a little bit of sense, but, um, you know, I'm going to jump ahead, but, you know, when it comes to the humidity, if you're going to be using a mister, then I definitely suggest always taking the mealworms out before you mist because the mealworms will drown if there's even a little bit of fluid in the dish. So, um, for the habitat, like I was saying, you want humidity, you want to have a nice, um, you know, uh, a, a nice floor that will help, you know, keep, keep in humidity. So, usually what we use is the um, substrate that is, I'm... I'm blanking right now, but it, it, it kind of seems like, you know, earth, but it's, I believe, coconut fiber substrate. Um, you know, de definitely double check me on that one, but I believe that's the most common one used. And that's one where you don't just want to mist it until, you know, it looks, you know, moist. You want to, you know, mix it up and, you know, remist it. Like, you know, you want to have, like I said, a lot of humidity in there. And you want to have, you know, natural looking, you know, plants. Uh, and the vines are going to be the most important ones. So you want to be able to hang a suspension of, of uh, vines in the uh, habitat, and that's where they're going to be spending the majority of their time. Um, again, they like to be up high. It's just a, a safety thing for them. In fact, if you get lucky enough that you have one that enjoys being held in the beginning of their life, then they're going to immediately climb up to the top of your head. They like to be up as high as they can possibly reach. It's just instinct, so if, God forbid, you ever do lose track of one outside of the habitat, start looking up. You know, that's that's typically where they should be. In fact, that's a really good indicator, oftentimes, if they're not feeling so great, if you see them hanging out more towards the bottom. Um, you know, uh, a lot of times uh, the temperature might not be quite right. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you might see them at the bottom. Uh, I'm kind of jumping around here, but yeah. So, you know, when it comes to the habitat, you want to have, you know, all of that stuff in there. That That's, you know, good. You want to have a water source. And here's where it starts to get tricky. This is where chameleons are a little bit more of a pain in the butt than most other reptiles, where they have this thing where, I mean, th this is what I was told, but I've also seen exceptions to the rule. But mostly, they can't see standing water. Or at least they don't instantly recognize it as being a viable drinking source. Um, I have seen a chameleon drink out of a water dish and most likely that was because it was so dying of dehydration that it happened to stumble upon a the, the puddle of water and realized oh finally something to, to drink and it drank even against its own instincts so the reason why instinctually they don't want to is because again they they are usually in you know rainforest setting so the cleanest water is going to be what has just fallen from the sky and is dripping down on leaves and so they're used to seeing moving water, so they're used to seeing droplets, and then they'll, you know, uh, suck up the droplets. Those are usually the healthiest sources of water. If it's water that they have found in just a stagnant little, you know, puddle of water, well, I mean, you got to figure how many parasites and, you know, mosquito larvae and all this rather other stuff is, is in that water. So they instinctively want to have stuff that is, you know, constant motion. So 
you got to get yourself a dripper. Now, there might be other drippers on the market. This might just be my personal experience with drippers, but they are the most finicky, um, troublesome things to get just quite right. You basically want to be able to set the valve up so that so it's basically a container that has a little you know a hose uh, that you would ideally have over a water dish that has you know like some you know false plant in it, and so then it goes the water goes from the spout to drip onto the fake leaf and then the leaf drip into the dish and to get that drip setting just right is such a pain in the butt because it'll change over over the course of the day so let's say you have it set up just right where it's it's having a bloop 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 something along that I know that's not a very scientific way of saying it. You basically just heard me say bloop, pause, bloop. But, you know, nothing that's just like bloop, 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 and nothing that's taking so long that you get impatient while you're watching it for it to finally come out. But you just want to have a constant dripping source of water. That's where they're going to get their water from. And ideally, you want to have it go from the spigot, because they can see that it's coming out of the spigot. So if they are smart, they can actually time it so they can lick it off of the spigot. But otherwise, you want to have it so that it drops onto a fake leaf, and then it, you know, takes its time to drop off of the leaf, and that's probably where they're going to drink that, and then eventually drops into the dish where that's where they're going to leave it alone. In fact, most oftentimes when they're drinking, they're pooping. So oftentimes there's a big old turd floating in the, uh, <laughs> floating in the dish anyway. So it makes sense that they wouldn't want to eat from that anyway, right? But yeah, getting the water source just right is is you know constant constant effort because if you think about it, you know the 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 force of water from from this height is going to be you know different from that height, so it's going to definitely slow down once it gets lower. Um, also, there's the odd chance that you might get the teeniest bit of debris in the water, and then once that gets to the spigot, if you have it really close tight, well that little debris of water could be the difference between a drop coming out or not, and. It's, you know, the, the, yeah, the water thing is just definitely a huge pain. Um, and again, I'm not trying to scare you away. I just want you to be as informed as possible when you go to purchase this animal because, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing worse than either having to return a pet once you've already gotten all the stuff, you know, prepared. And uh, even worse, you know, having one die on you and then having that on your conscience. So uh, that's what I'm trying to prevent when I do these videos. And I usually try and end on a, on a positive note. So if you want to stick around till the end... For, you know some some you know nice stuff to say about chameleons then awesome but right now I'm just definitely giving you the skinny on what you're getting yourself into so now how are you gonna keep the place humid I mean you could spray it multiple times a day with a mister and that is an option but you know we're talking where you know some of the more desert creatures you'd be able to get away with you know two three times you know spraying them in a day um, these guys are gonna need to be constantly maintained you know so you know, unfortunately, that usually means that if you have a regular life and a, and a job and stuff, that you're going to, like, you know, overhose them in the, in the morning. Uh, maybe if you're allowed to do a stopover during the lunchtime, overhosing them at lunch, and then, you know, you get home. And then you can kind of, you know, maintain it from there until you go to bed. But, you know, there, there's some people that use a, a fogger. And uh, that's one where I haven't even gotten into, you know, just having one that constantly makes, you know, the fog and stuff. But, you know, again, like now, now that's why you're one of the main reasons why you need such a huge habitat is like think about all the stuff that I'm telling you that you need. You know, we're talking, you know, vines, water dishes, you know, dripper, fogger, um, you know, mealworm dish, you know, like all, all this, you know, fake plants, like all this stuff is just, you know, quickly taking up space where it should be space that the chameleon can get around in. You know, it doesn't want to get too clogged. So, you know, it, it, it can be a bit of a pain in the butt, you know, having the correct kind of setup where you have, you know, airflow and you have humidity and then you have, you know, all the accoutrement, I guess you could say. And, uh, well, let's go ahead and get into the food. So, uh, with many lizards, and again, if you watch other lizard videos, you're going to, you know, think that I'm a broken record, but um, the most typical sources of protein for, uh, for lizards, reptiles, and, and the like are going to be crickets and mealworms. Um, crickets and mealworms both have different types of protein. Especially when they're young, you should try to have them have a variety of both in order to get the proteins that are necessary to grow. And it's difficult getting the appropriately sized ones. So you can't have a cricket that's too big. They're not going to be able to eat it. They're going to be afraid of it. They're not going to go after it. You can't have one that's too small. It's going to be so small that they don't even see it worth the trouble. 
Um, and, you know, they're like, if I try and go after that, I'm going to get more dirt in my mouth than an actual bug. So you want to have it appropriately sized. And I can't stress that enough because it's unfortunate it happens sometimes, but we did have a vendor that gave us one that really should never have been sent. It was way underweight for us to be able to sell. And so trying to get that thing up to weight was a huge struggle. Um, it's, it's one that I made my own personal, you know, uh, goal. And every morning I would get infuriated because the mealworms in the dish were practically the length of the uh, chameleon. And to be fair to the people that I was working with, it's like, on, honestly, when you're picking through the mealworm dishes, trying to find ones that are actually going to be small enough to be eaten by a chameleon, it, it's going to be a long time when they, you know, most retail doesn't give you much time to do a opening, you know, setup. So most people were just finding the smallest ones they could find in that moment and then putting them in the dish. Well, I mean, the chameleon wasn't going after him. Even if there were a couple appropriately sized ones, you know, the, the odds of getting a bigger one while trying to get the smaller one were so big that he just wasn't eating the mealworms. Uh, same thing with the crickets. We couldn't get crickets small enough for him to eat. Like, it was, he was, he was so small he practically should have been eating, you know, uh, fruit flies. But, you know, I, I would, you know, find the smallest ones. I would find the babiest of the babies and, uh, you know, try and separate them from the slightly larger ones. And slowly over time, he uh, would, would gain a gram, you know, maybe uh, every few days to a week, depending on how often I could check in and make sure. I, I say he, I mean, I'm just, you know, throwing a you know, label on, don't get offended. But, um, you know, he, she, whatever it might have been, um, you know, slowly would gain, a, you know, maybe a gram, you know, a, a week. You know, if I was lucky, sometimes go up, sometimes go down. But it really drove home the point of how you really need to get the appropriate sized uh, bugs for them. Now, uh, with those guys, uh, some places will claim that they sell crickets that are already gut fed with the appropriate ingredients that you don't need to dust them. I always do recommend dusting them. So what dusting is, is you take a little calcium, vitamin powder, uh, you sprinkle it on the crickets before they eat them. First of all, it turns them a bright white so they're easier to spot for the bug to eat, uh, for the, you know, lizard to eat, but also it makes them uh, get some of the nutrients that they might not otherwise get. Helps keep them healthy, uh, healthy, you know, lizards, uh, happy lizards. So. Um, one of the other ways that for their health is they don't just need to eat, they also need to um, bask. So heat, heat and um, UVB lighting is so important. So nine times out of ten, if I see a chameleon having issues and the bugs are the appropriate size, n most likely the issue is going to be the heat and lighting. So um, I'm a huge fan of heat mats for the heat. But these guys can't just get by with heat mats alone. They need to have a UV light source, much like we do, in order to make vitamin D. Um, with everything that's going on, people are now more uh, are now aware more than ever about how important vitamin D is in your life. Getting exposed to the sunlight, taking your supplements is so important. So for any um, non-nocturnal lizard, uh, vitamin D is just as important to them as it is to us. So uh, UVB light's tricky. Uh, I've mentioned it in previous lizard videos, but basically I'm going to say it again. Just because it still lights up doesn't mean that you can leave it alone and it's still working. Uh, UVB lights need to be changed out on a regular basis because they will lose their UV capabilities. Um, just because they turn on and, and, and sh display light does not mean that they're getting UV rays anymore. There's a, there's a certain element inside of the light that will burn out over time, and it'll still turn on and be, be bright, but it won't actually be giving them UV. So if you're seeing a lizard getting, you know, a chameleon getting lethargic, Think back about the last time that you changed out the UV bulb, UV bulb, uh, UV bulb, UVB bulb, mostly, but it's it's usually the case that and if the heat bulb, which typically may or may not show light, is burnt out. So that's why it's so vitally important. I always say to have not only a humidity gauge, or in a chameleon's case, maybe maybe more than one, but you always want to have two thermometers in any lizard's habitat. And that, the reason why is because you always need to have a warm side and a cool side. The cool side will be the side with the water, and hopefully the mealworms. The warm side, so you don't cook the mealworms, and so you don't boil the water, is going to be on the opposite side. And if the temperature ever drops, then they're going to be, you know, not so happy. They'll be moving slow, um, you know, they won't be hungry. So keeping it up to the appropriate temperature. And again, I'm not going to give you the specifics because I want you to do some research, but you know they do need to have it significantly warmer than room temperature. There's some animals you will be able to get away with. Having them be in the room temperature environment, the chameleon is not one of them. Uh, you know, in the room temperature humidity, the chameleon is not one of them. You know, like the chameleon is going to have a far different environment than what you have in your house. And so 
that's why it's so important to make sure the habitat's appropriate, and that's why it's so painstaking to get the appropriate habitat, because to get all of these elements in one, um, they, they don't have much of a market for. It's very interesting that they have, you know, all of these chameleons getting sold in pet stores, and yet somebody's not cornering the market on the big habitats that they're going to need by the time they're fully grown. So, you know, um, you know, I covered most of, you know, what you need before you even get them, but let's go over why you even want to get them. So nine times out of 10, a person wants to have a pet because it's something that they want to be able to touch, interact with, have a physical relationship with. And this is a, you know, like many of the ones I'm going to talk about in, in this is chameleon is technically not going to be one that you should assume that you're going to be able to have physical contact with. Now, if you're lucky, most chameleons, when they start out in the pet store, are going to be young, small, and in way too small of a habitat because unfortunately it's supposed to be a temporary thing. Like that's not supposed to be their forever home. So, by the way, if you ever go to a pet store and then you see, you know, you, you want to get, you know, like say a 10 gallon tank for, you know, a, a bearded dragon and say, well, that's about the size that you have right there. Well, yeah, this is a temporary holding thing. We only have so much space. Um, this is not supposed to be the example. This is supposed to be like, you know, like, like like a carrying case to, to your home. Like, you know, this is not what they're supposed to be in for the rest of their lives. In fact, that's why most animals, once they get to be past a certain age, will be discounted to get them out of there because now it's becoming unfair to the size of the habitat that they have. So that's just something to keep in mind. Don't use a pet store as an example where, well, it's working for you, so I should. No, no, oftentimes it's something that they have to do out of necessity or there's stuff going on that you don't even realize. Like for instance, with the aquatics, um, there's an entire, like, under the aquarium, you know, um, system going on where there's a huge gigantic filter that you're not seeing. There's a, a ginormous, you know, basin of water that is actually more gallons than you realize is that they're in. So, you know, try not to recreate what you find in a pet store. Recreate what you find that they appropriately should be in. But um, back to socializing. So with, with a uh, small chameleon, more often than not, will... If you open up the habitat, they will be willing to come out of the habitat and crawl up your finger, and then from that point on, maybe all the way up to your head, and you think that's how your relationship's going to be the rest of your life. Well, that's not the case. What's going on is that this tiny little thing is cramped in a, a, a too small of a space and hasn't developed its adult be, um, you know, behaviors and uh, attitude yet. So... What's actually happening is that they're just like, look, even if you're going to eat me, like anything's better than being in this habitat. And so for the first, yeah, you know, a couple months of your life, way outside of the return policy, um, you might actually have a friendly chameleon that likes to hang out on top of your head because it's like, hey, this is so big, wide and open. And maybe if he's not paying attention, I might be able to climb up and then get the heck out of here and find a better place to hang out. When they get older and bigger and more surly and more territorial, then you're probably not going to be able to handle them. And I know that that's a huge factor in why a lot of people get them. So don't assume that the chameleon that you get, regardless of its behavior when you get them, is going to want you to hold, handle them. In fact, they're probably going to start changing color, swelling up their neck, opening up their mouth, saying, hey, I might bite you. you know? So a chameleon is usually more of a look, don't touch, like many reptiles that I'm going to talk about. That's why I started my very first reptile video with... Um, bearded dragons and leopard geckos because in my experience those are the two that actually either tolerate or even enjoy being handled it's a very rare feature for any kind of you know reptile and, and let's be honest some of the furry ones too some of the furry ones that you think you know are going to be super cute and you know oh look at them they have the little human hands and stuff it's like most of them don't want to have anything to do with you you're a big monster you're a predator potentially you know so you know just things to consider but you know so with the chameleon um I know that you might have wanted to handle them, and maybe this is a deal breaker. And if so, I'm, I'm almost kind of glad because then that means that you didn't have to give it the hardships of going through all the stress of you know going to this new environment that may or may not be set up properly. Um, and and again, I can't stress it enough. This is a channel for adults because if you are a kid, you usually can't buy the animal. You need to have your parent do it. So hopefully, you're a responsible parent that's doing your research and realizing, okay, well, this chameleon is might not be enjoyed being handled by uh you know roughly by the kid i i i should i should refer to this more often most people do know of the movie finding nemo and the little girl with braces it's it's a great character because 
her her roughness with the um, you know the, just the fish alone is a great example of how kids usually don't understand that tapping on the glass stresses out any animal in any habitat, not just the fish, but the hamster. But you know, I, I don't get the desire to tap 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 on the glass. I mean, maybe that's because I wasn't really into animals until later on in life, and so I just never saw the point. But I never got the whole appeal of, like, stressing the crap out of the animal. First of all, you might not be old enough to realize, you know, their body language. But, you know, now that I see body language, it's just like, hey, yeah, you just made the fish scatter. Was that the appeal? I don't know. But, you know, so, you know, kids and animals should be very, very much supervised. And even then, maybe it's just a good idea to not have them interact at all. Maybe it's just like, you know, pretend it's a television that, that's real, you know, like, and just, you know, look and, you know, hey, you can help with the feeding. Help with the feeding, you know, not do the feeding yourself, because again, you don't want to dump too many crickets in at a time because they're going to get all over the chameleon. So that means you're either going to have to go to the store all the time or you're going to have to set up a cricket habitat yourself, which I've talked about in previous videos. is a big pain in the butt in and of itself. I might do a separate one just so that I can say, instead of having to sift through my previous videos to see why doing crickets is such a pain in the butt, because I don't want to have to keep doing the same thing every time, I might just do a separate cricket video, something to think about. This is a work in progress, so sorry that I'm work working things out in my head as I'm telling you about chameleons. And you're like, I don't care about the crickets, I want to hear about the chameleons. So, sorry about that. I'm just, you know, this is this is a, uh, you know, a, a work in progress. So, um, I think that I tried to dissuade you enough from having one. If you're still dead set on it, you know, go for it, go crazy, be responsible, do your research. Um, I got to tell you, though, having said all of that, I see the appeal, all right? I think out of everything in the store that I um, could watch, you know, eat, you know, and that's even including snakes. And I'm sorry if your take on snakes is different from my take on snakes. I mean, you know, I, I, I think that it's fascinating how they rear up, they do the coil thing. I mean, you know, we, we, we never fed, you know, live in, in our store because it helps keep them, you know, docile. Um, but just like the whole action of like, if it had been, you know, a living creature, like, you know, what they instinctively like to do. Um, but there's a little bit of guilt to that because I also love mice, you know, I, I love, you know, mice are awesome and I, you know, always had mixed feelings about watching one, you know, get eaten. So, you know, I don't really have much of a personal attachment to crickets and mealworms. Sorry if you're a bug lover, but it is what it is. You know, crickets are kind of dinks to each other and they do smell pretty awful. And, um, you know, mealworms are just, you know, worms that, you know, eventually turn into beetles. So, you know, I never mind it seeing one of them go. So, um... I, I gotta admit, there's probably nothing cooler in a pet store than um, doing the feeding time in the morning and having a chameleon have both of their eyes going in different directions and then all of a sudden lock in on a cricket. And then they... And what's funny is, why do they slowly stalk them? I don't know if it's because they're still picturing, you know, like potential predators, but the cricket ain't paying attention to how fast you move. I think it's hilarious that they're just like, I'm gonna go slow and climb down to a low part of the branch and then open up and then that tongue just comes out shkoom. I don't know if I'm dating myself, but like, you know, I don't know if you ever uh, saw the gigantic sticky things or whatever they're called now, but it's just basically like, you know, like a rubbery sticky, you know, thing on a string that you can like, you know, whap and it'll stick against a wall. I mean, whoever designed those had to have been a chameleon lover because that's basically what's going on. They have a, a sticky by nature tongue that can extend far beyond the length of their actual body, which is insane to me. And they have, like, pinpoint accuracy. So what's crazy is that this is a uh, prey slash predator when it comes to the eyes. So those eyes are just super cool when it comes to the fact that they can actually see in two completely different directions at once. They can actually see directly in front of them with one eye and directly behind them with another eye and, and process the information for both. Like, I mean, you know, a a anybody that has, you know, drank too much and seen double... Um, knows that, you know, if, if you have two images to process, you know, that is just like, you know, a little bit too much. Although I pay attention to, 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 to the left or to the right one. They can do in, in, you know, like, you know, multiple different, you know, like photos, you know, per, uh, you know, particular amount of time. Um, it's, it's insane that like they can process all of that. And then when they do see some prey, that they can go shoop and now I'm a predator. Now I have two eyes so I can do depth perception. And when they do that tongue, it's, it's with the accuracy of somebody that's practiced, you know, like, say, archery, you know, for a long time. Like, they, they can hit that bullseye, you know. I'm trying to think of a time I've seen a miss, basically what I'm saying. is So, 
Watching them eat is one of the neatest things ever, and I see that that is one of the biggest appeals for, you know, getting one. So, I mean, I get it, you know? If, if this hasn't turned you off of it, and you're still like, you know what? Sounds like a pain in the butt, but I'm willing to try, because those guys are pretty freaking neat. Um, just don't expect them to, you know, be like, oh, look, I have them in front of a white background, and now they're white. Oh, look, I have them in front of a checkerboard background, and they're checkerboard. Don't get them for the color-changing aspect. Don't get them because you think they're going to be an easy animal to be able to hold. You know, get them because... Uh, especially, all right, especially with the piebald veiled chameleons. So real quick, I understand that there is a positive to both you and the pet sometimes because there's a variety of veiled chameleons called piebald where they almost look like burn victims. I mean, that's a mean way to put it, but basically they have patches of pink on them, like just random places they have pink on them. And so it's, it's rare, and so they're going to cost a little bit more. But that's something that actually does happen naturally. And the problem is in the wild... Those are one of the first to go because now they don't have the green to match their environment. That pink doesn't change color when they get stressed and think of predators around. So they would actually last a lot longer and have a lot happier of a life in your care. So I do see the benefit of owning a pet, not just for your, you know, selfish reasons, but for the, for the pet's, you know, health as well, as long as you do it properly. So, you know, in that case, I think go crazy. I, once I got used to them, I think that they are the coolest looking things. I love seeing the different patches. I saw one that I called mittens because it only had the pink on the on the hands. You know, the hands, by the way, are just their own cool, crazy thing, you know. But, um, and if you're ever curious, that's one way to sex a, a, a chameleon is that the um, uh, males actually have a little bump on the back leg of their, uh, of their paws. Just a cute little bit of trivia to throw in there towards the end. If you manage to stay this long, I figure I owe you something. Um, so yeah, if I haven't dissuaded you, then, you know, congrats on the new edition. I, I hope that you put in the time and effort to know what you're getting into so that you can do it ap appropriately. And, um, if you find somebody that's, you know, making habitats for chameleons at a decent price, you know, do kind of like what I do with my Monday morning podcasts and, uh, give a shout out to, um, you know, to, 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 to the local, you know, independent people that are trying to make it in life, you know, and, um, you know, I say support local businesses. It's uh, it, it only makes sense because it's just going back into the same community that you're living in. So why wouldn't you? So um, yeah, hopefully, you know, maybe if I uh, start getting more comments soon, somebody can mention, hey, if you're in this area, this person does it for a decent price and they know what they're talking about, and you know, they make sure to, you know, make it so that it's it's good for a chameleon, but you know, also you know, sturdy and and you know, not potent, uh, you know, not prone to getting warped by all the humidity that's going to happen to them. So I mean, yeah. There's a, there's a lot to consider. I'll shut up so you can, you know, process that and hopefully do some more research. But thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Uh, like and subscribe. All the usual stuff. But, um, you know, if you do decide to go with one, congrats on the new edition.